Good evening. My name is Dan Berger. I'm a member of the Council. Our speaker this evening is Lawrence A. Pizzullo, Executive Director of Catholic Relief Services, who's going to speak on challenges in the New World Order, conflict in humanitarian aid. Now, here in Baltimore, we've had a lot of bad news. But in 1989, we had some very good news when Catholic Relief Services moved here from New York. And as a result, on West Fayette Street, we have 165 dedicated, skilled, knowledgeable people who are providing humanitarian aid throughout the world. They're providing a great deal of it. In uh, 1991, they spent $260 million in aid or food, and they spent it for development assistance, for disaster relief, for general welfare, and for refugee resettlement. The Catholic Relief Services was begun as the Bishop's Fund of the American Catholic Church in 1943. It was later institutionalized and established as a permanent organization. It operates a little bit on little State Department lines with bureaus and country desk officers and people in the field. So it's fitting that Mr. Pizzullo comes from the diplomatic service. He was in the U.S. Foreign Service from 1957 to 1982. He had many posts in Latin America. He was ambassador to Uruguay. He was ambassador to Nicaragua during the fall of Somoza. He's writing a book about it. It will be out next year. And he retired from the Foreign Service in 1982 and accepted this job. As a result, he was in charge of the move to Baltimore. And for that, we are extremely grateful. With that, I'm very happy to present the Honorable Lawrence A. Pizzullo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. <clears throat> uh, it really is a pleasure being here tonight uh, and to talk on this particular subject, which <clears throat> I think is getting uh, too little attention, uh, simply because it is not the kind of issue people focus on. <clears throat> In brief, let me, let me give you a sense of the, the focus of the, my presentation. Uh, ever since World War II, uh, we in the United States have been living in a bipolar world, one facing a, an aggressive and dangerous enemy uh, whose designs on portions of the world uh, impinged on what we consider to be uh, the vital interest of the United States. Uh, that experience, which thank goodness has now ended with the collapse of the Soviet Empire, <clears throat> has left us somewhat exhausted because we, we have come to the conclusion, not, without, not with anyone saying so, that, um, that somehow the world will, uh, will uh, develop its own pace of, of, of growth from here on in and that the threats that existed in the past uh, no longer will come in the future, uh, and the U.S. Uh, role in this new world uh, will be a minor one. Uh, I think the events of the last three years would argue quite differently, that um, problems which in many ways were, were covered over by the, the bipolar world we lived in, the rivalry between the two nations, the support we gave to leaders in one country or another, as did the Soviets, uh, once removed has allowed these festering problems, some of them historic, going back uh, hundreds of years, to come to the surface in, very, in a very ugly and, and cruel way, uh, and effect, in, in effect, uh, uh, endangering the peace of uh, all kinds of areas around the world, everything from, 
from uh, Central Europe uh, to the Balkans to the former Soviet colonies, uh, f former parts of the Soviet Union, uh, to countries in Africa and the Far East and so on. Uh, now that, that is not the New World Order uh, some people uh, were led to believe would follow on this bipolar world. And my sense is that unless the world community with U.S. as a leader is willing to take on the challenge of this new world, uh, to look at ways in which we can help the parties in these conflicts uh, reach common ground, and at times even urge it uh, with, with, with strength, uh, we will find ourselves propelled into issues at high cost and a great embarrassment whether we like it or not. So the choice is not between doing nothing uh, and finding this new world order. It's between either doing something that brings it about or facing the prospect of being driven into problems beyond our control at a great embarrassment and at great cost. And I do think with, with leadership from the U.S. Uh, and restructuring of some of the institutions in the U.N so that they have the capacity uh, to respond to conflict uh, in meaningful ways and to look at some of the sub-regional groupings in Latin America and the Far East and Africa uh, and urging them, as, uh, as the Contadora group did uh, several years ago, uh, to engage themselves in uh, negotiating uh, uh, and working with parties in conflict uh, I think we would find the resources out there, the human capability uh, to, uh, to bring parties to agreement who now find themselves driven deeper and deeper into conflict. In Desert Storm, we used the UN system when you no longer had a bipolar wor world, when you no longer had a Soviet veto. You could then go to the UN when there was a blatant act of aggression and you could, under the US, UN mantle, you could take an action against a, an errant state. But that was a very dramatic situation. In most of these cases, the errant state is hard to, is hard to perceive. The actions that have to be taken are difficult. Politicians, by very nature, are timid, not only in this country, every place. And the question is, who forces the world community or this country or any country to take on the high, hard ones? Anybody can hit the soft pitch. It's the tough one that requires the grit of organizations and institutions that will make the decision and force people or force, in, force uh, errant groups into a negotiating mode. So the UN, if we're going to use it, and I think it has to begin to be, become the first port of call as we look to the problems that are going to beset us, should be the first port of call in terms of restructuring. And I'm not going to go in this evening into where that restructuring would go, but certainly if the UN is going to play a more active role, it has to have the capacity and the authority to take on issues within a framework of advice and consent and support. We don't want an international organization that's running off on its own. It has to work within certain understood constraints. But it should have the power and the authority to act in these very difficult circumstances early in the game. My concern is that even there, even though the UN should be the first stop on this search for institutions that can deal with world problems, we really have to look down, downscale it a bit. And we have to look at sub-regional organizations. The OAS in this hemisphere, Organization of American States, which has been dormant most of the time and on rare occasions has involved itself, certainly could be urged, as it has in the past, to take on a more active position. It acted fairly, fairly vigorously in the case of Haiti. It didn't resolve the issue, but it was an instance where the OAS moved to take on an issue. 
the OAU in Africa, which is even more dormant than the OAS, uh, resists involvement. In fact, there hasn't been a single African crisis that I, I know of where the OAU has taken on an active role. Partially it's because the very Af African milieu is very suspicious, as most small countries are, of any kind of incursion from outside. If you were a small country and you were trying to defend your boundaries, the first thing you would talk about is non-intervention. The point I'm making is non-intervention is fine, but it doesn't resolve the problems we're talking about. So the OAU is caught up in a historic uh, inability to act, but that can change. And we have other institutions. We have this, the EEC in Europe. We have the U.S. the European Community uh, on the on the political side. We have ASEAN out in the Far East, and we have every once in a while an unlikely group of of countries that come together for no good reason that you could see at the outset and take on an issue. Remember the Contadora group in Latin America which Washington wasn't terribly happy about. But the Contadora group, which had no historic relationship to anything, these were countries on the rim of the Caribbean, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Panama, and Costa Rica, who were very concerned about what they saw happening in Central America, because they saw the two powers playing the game. We were feeding the conflict from one side, and the Soviets were feeding it from the other side. And they saw no long-term benefit in that. And they began to ask questions about how you could bring these countries to start looking at their, at their internal problem. And it didn't work at first. And there's no question Washington frustrated it. But slowly, it had resonance. And the resonance was picked up, eventually, by the five presidents in Central America, and out of that grew what today is a very positive movement in Central America, namely the beginning of the nation building rather than the nation tearing apart. So I would argue, too, that we should be encouraging ad hoc groups, Contadora or whatever group came along that wanted to involve itself in negotiation, arbitration, resolving problems, or whatever. I don't think we can spend too much time or too much effort in learning the skills of arbitration and learning the skills of negotiation. It's basic to whatever resolution you're ever going to have to, uh, to disputes between people, because the very nature of disputes is that the two combatants see no common ground. Otherwise, they wouldn't be fighting in the first place. And the art of negotiation, of arbitration, is to show them the common ground. And if they don't like to see it, you push them toward the common ground. And if need be, you use force to get to the common ground. Uh, I don't think in the, in the individual cases I'm talking about, it's always a matter of talk. There are going to have to be times when something further has to be done. I don't think Yugoslavia would have disintegrated into what it has if some measure of force were used. Not putting American troops on the ground, but making sure that some of the part parties there understood that their use of force would be reciprocated in some way. Now, I know you could talk to our military people, especially after Vietnam, and they will say we don't want to commit one American troop except in those cases where we have a clear political purpose to be gained, i.e., victory. Well, that's fine and dandy. It hasn't worked in some of the major conflicts we've, we've fought in in this century. It was fine in World War I and World War II. It didn't work in Korea. We had to settle for something else. Vietnam was one of the great shames of our, our time. And conflict and the use of force need not end up with victory on one side. It can force parties to face very often what they don't want to face specifically. 
So I come finally to basically where, where I think the, the leadership has to come in this so-called new world order. I'm of the conviction you've got to start with a nation state with the power, prestige, and capability to lead the rest of the world in the direction I think has to be, has to be followed. And the only country I see that can do that is the United States of America. Uh, we are a preeminent country, not only because we have the military power, certainly we like the economic power now, but the United States has been and continues to be the symbol that many countries around the world, people who can't even speak up and be heard, who consider this the preeminent symbol of what they would like their societies to be. Despite all our arguments, despite all our problems, despite the, the, the horrible situation we have in some of our cities and ghettos, this country is a model. And it's a model because it's an open country, it's a free country, it adheres to law, it adheres to the belief that people mean something, and that may, not so that may sound very unusual, but there are a lot of countries in this world where people don't mean anything. So we are a symbol. We are a country that can play the role. Now, how do you play the role? And here is the most difficult thing of all. Most of our institutions in the foreign policy field were forged in the Cold War. I spent 28 years in the Foreign Service. You never made an argument in foreign policy which wasn't based upon the competitive aspect of your position. You didn't argue for, for any kind of resources within the U.S. government if you couldn't show that it furthered our interests. Against whom? Against the Soviet Union. You didn't say it was good for mankind to do this. You said this will further us and prevent them. So it became innate within the within the U.S. institutions to argue the bipolar war, war, world. If you didn't, people thought you were naive. You argued the case of the competition with the Soviet Union, and they did the very same thing. Now that's created a mindset among our institutions, within every one of them, within the State Department, within the agency, CIA, within USIA, and within the Defense Department. It's a competitive game. Is that what we need in the future? Who are we competing with? Who are we trying to outdo? Can we reshape our institutions so that the people who come in start thinking in terms of the leadership role that we assert? Ultimately to further our interests, because I would make the case that a peaceful, prosperous world is beneficial to the United States. There's no question about that. It's good for trade. It's good for investment. It's good in any way you, you can imagine it. You're not investing in destruction. You're investing in benefiting from constructive action. So the case can be made. It's got to be articulated. But our institutions, with leadership at the top, have to reform and think of their role in the world ahead. How does the State Department conform itself? Do we need all these Soviet speakers? Or do we need people who know how to get down into the, the ghettos and talk to people who aren't living now in these, these fortresses we're built for embassies? I mean, it's a shameful thing if you've been overseas going into some of our embassies. They look like maximum security prisons because they've been attacked at times. And you don't want people to be risking death when they serve the United States of America, but they needn't be maximum security prisons. They needn't be so onerous and so, so awful looking that people are afraid to come near them. Worse, that the people inside are afraid to come out. I mean, if you house somebody in a prison, his sense is if he's outside, he's gonna be in trouble. Well, that doesn't make sense. We've got to reshape, we've got to reshape our thinking. If we're going to know what's going on in Somalia, we've got to have people walking those villages. We've got to have people talking to clan leaders. If we're going to understand the world we're going to live in, we'd better be out there walking the streets. We'd better have young officers 
who like that and don't want to go to cocktail parties so that we, we have a sense of what's happening within these societies before it blows up. Same thing in intelligence services. As I say, I spend an awful lot of time in U.S. government, and intelligence gets, gets to be one of those, those grand sort of magical terms. Intelligence, in most cases, in most cases, is what is available from public sources in most societies. Now, I'm not talking about the secret intrigues going on at high levels in government. That you have to get information on. But to find out what's happening economically, to find out what's happened politically, to get a, si a sense of social change and what various elements of the society are doing, you got to walk the streets. You got to talk to people. You got to read their newspapers. You got to listen to their radio stations. And that can be trained. That is an exciting thing to do. I spent most of my career doing just that. And it's fascinating. That's intelligence. Then you can talk to people. Then you can understand what's going on in their congresses. You can understand what's going on in their villages. Otherwise, it'll pass you by. So, are we capable of that? I'm, I'm convinced you can retrain so that our institutions are relevant to the new world. State Department, CIA, and defense. Now, what about the Defense Department? That is the most, I think, the most challenging issue of all because we have built up this very muscular Defense Department with, with extremely talented and, and highly skilled people. The sophistication that you'd find in the military on the, in the most technical fields probably surpasses what you find in most private industry, which is one of our problems today. The point is, is that the kind of armed force we need for the world ahead. And I would say that needs a very, very good look, very careful look. It's not bringing it down from 300 billion to 150 billion or 106 billion. That's politicians' baloney. The real issue is, do we have an armed forces that's capable of doing the things that the United States is going to be called upon to do? Can we send 15 people into X place to do something and have them be effective. That's the issue. Not a battalion, not an army, not an aircraft carrier. Can we do it? Can we retrain, reshape ourselves? That's where I think it has to begin. And from there, I think the, 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 the model we set as a country, a leader, concern about the new world order so that it isn't any more disorderly than it is now, concern about the welfare of people, concern about the victims of these terrible tragedies. It's, it's, it's a crying shame to see people starving to death when there's food available. And there's food available in this world sufficient to feed everybody. No question about that. That's just factually true. And yet people are starving to death, children dying, mothers dying, probably a whole generation going in one country called Somalia. Well, Somalia is just symptomatic of what I'm talking about. It's happening in, in Mozambique. It's happening in Angola. It will continue to happen. Let me just make one last point, <coughs> and then I'll take any questions. <clears throat> Angola has been going through some tough times ever since 1974 when the government in, in, in Portugal, it was, a, it was a colony, you know, Mozambique and Angola were uh, colonies of Portugal. In 1974, the, the dictator in Portugal was overthrown by the military, and the military from the provinces, the military that was tired of fighting in Angola and Mozambique, incidentally. And it was a very popular revolution. Washington was every, very concerned. I remember being there uh, because they thought it was going to be a leftist revolution. I mean, these fellows were military men. I remember going out there and meeting with some of them. Henry Kissinger was scared to death that this was going to be another communist country because they were overthrowing a friend. 
who happened to be a, one of these old old timers who had who had really had time passing by. <laughs> well, these military men were not revolutionary. In fact, they they wore themselves out trying to govern. Uh, with a no, no time at all, they turned it over to politicians, and Portugal has gone very nicely, thank you. But they dropped the two colonies, and they dropped them like hot potatoes. And Angola went into an internal war, a very vicious internal war, so did Mozambique, aided and abetted by friends from here and elsewhere. But just recently, an accord was reached between the government, which has been a socialist government, but turning rational, and an insurgency led by a very charismatic figure called Savimbi. And with the United States pressure and European pressure, they reached an accord and they had an election. The election has just finished. And the returns aren't out, but it looks very much as if Savimbi's gonna lose. So what is Savimbi doing? He's saying, I won't accept these these results, I'm going to go off, I'm going back to the bush, uh, and I'm going to fight. Uh, I won't accept these returns. These returns, by the way, have been overseen by outside observers, all of whom, from what I've read, including the United States, say it was a, a fair election. What does the world community do? Do we sit aside and let Savimbi play this game? or actions taken quickly, very quickly, to call Mr. Savimbi aside. I think the institutions we have, to repeat, are institutions of the past. We have mindsets of the past. We've got to begin here to see ways of, of repairing those, inviting in the international community, bringing in any actors, sub-regional, international to be participant in this so that we don't see the Somalias, which could have been resolved easily. Not quickly, but easily. And the, and the Angolas, and the Yugoslavias, and the Cambodias, and the Afghanistans, and the Mozambiques, and the Liberias, and it goes on and on and on and on. And the sad truth of, of the of, of the cases that organizations like CRS and others get in at the tail end of all these things after it's messed up and in a fitful state, and then people expect some miracle to occur because you bring in some food and medicine, when the political structure, the social structure, is ripped apart, and you're building on sand, and you're, then you're accused, very often, of feeding the conflict or you're bringing in assistance, which is being ripped off because you can't control it, therefore you're feeding the conflict. So we get caught in this idiot position of trying to assist and getting caught up in something in which the structure is rotten, where there is no framework within which a rational approach can be taken to, to assist the victims. Uh, I'm leaving a few copies of a couple pamphlets for those of you interested <coughs> in some of the approaches we're making and some other organizations in terms of looking at dealing in conflict situations on the humanitarian side. What I've spoken about tonight is my own sense that you've got to have an international community looking at this, forgetting the past, training itself for the future, reshaping its institutions and its mindsets and looking for ways that you could resolve problems be before they become these ugly messages. Thank you. Uh, if any of you have questions or whatever, yes. The question was, I said that Washington did not support Contadora, and do I think that if we had a democratic administration, we'd have more chances of supporting Contadora? The errors made 
in supporting the Samosas and the Marcoses and the, and the Shahs of Iran was not partisan in terms of party. <coughs> Look at it. Parties on both sides made the same decision that we don't want to lose this country on our watch. Something happened in China after World War II, which was defined as our loss of China. And if you look at the history of China during World War II with the Kuomintang and the beginning of the, of the People's Party, which is still in power, uh, we never got over that trauma that China went communist. Uh, and no administration since then was willing to pay the price of losing a country to the other side. In large measure, that's what Vietnam was all about. If we could have said, you know, we do not have to try to fight in Vietnam to preserve an enclave in the South that probably is not viable and really does not further anybody's interest, whether it's part of Vietnam or not. If you did not have the China syndrome, the sense that a man in the White House was going to pay a tremendous price for losing something, uh, you would probably never have seen, you would probably have never seen a, a conflict in Vietnam. You would certainly might have avoided a conflict in Korea if we'd have not broken off with China and, and cut ourselves off from information and so on. But this wasn't partisan. I mean, you know, the best and the brightest in both parties were caught up in this. We were all caught up in it. We all felt the threat. Uh, this, was not, this was not an amorphous threat. I mean, make, make no bones about it. The Soviet Union was an aggressive uh, and, and, and very heavily armed state and vicious. So we were not, we were not reacting to, to a mirage. We were reacting to a very real threat. Uh, all I'm saying is that's over. And now we have to look at the new world. Since that real threat doesn't exist, isn't there a problem that you'll never get the international community to force these people to find common ground when they themselves, as the international community, have no common ground to cause them to be interested in it in the first place? Uh, there are no economic or personal ties that are substantial to some of these countries, so therefore, in our busy, self-interested lives, if the whole population starves to death, you know, it's unfortunate, but we don't care enough to intervene until such time someone brings a common interest between us and them to motivate us to do something about I think, it. I think that's crucial. The question is, uh, is it realistic to think, without that threat, that the world community is suddenly going to come together and say, we have to help this little country resolve its problems because there's no self-interest seen in the, in the incident? I think you're perfectly on. Uh, and that's why I say you have to, you have to develop a different sense of what, of what the world community is all about. Uh, if we're just going to look at trading part parties and those that for one reason or another are close to us, we're going to fall right back into that comfort syndrome of saying these other countries don't mean anything. But in my lifetime, in my lifetime, we've been involved in more countries and in more places that you couldn't believe of. Uh, why? Because Suddenly we found our interest on a hill in Korea, or a town in, in, in Somalia, or a place in Ethiopia. Now, the interesting thing is that public opinion, especially in a democracy, has a tremendous effect. The man sitting in that White House cannot be immune to it. He thinks he may. But ultimately, the demands on U.S. reaction will come, and it may come in an area he can't even pronounce. The world community is smaller than, than we give it credit for. If a leader like the United States began the dialogue of saying, how do we create, reshape institutions already there? I'm not suggesting we scrap the UN or scrap the US government. I'm saying reshaping so that they see as their focus the early reaction to problems and have trained personnel and the capacity to make those early reactions with subtlety, with hopefully with sensitivity and, and intelligent approaches, I think there would be I think there would be resonance. Because all these leaders face the same pressures. 
whether it's major in England or, or wherever, they face the pressures from their own public saying, why weren't you there? I mean, the, the, the Irish president, a lovely woman, was in Somalia a week ago. She came back aghast. Uh, why? I mean, why did the Irish president go to Somalia? Certainly, it's, it's not close <laughs> to, to Ireland, but these things impose, is what I'm saying. They impose on you, and there is no reason why you can't make the case, especially if you're making that case from the United States, that it's in the world's interest and the U.S. interest, and the U.S. is willing to put some effort into it to see if we couldn't do a better job. twice to the Dominican Republic as a medical missionary with the Catholic Medical Mission Board, but in connection with what you just said, I would like to say that uh, I found, and I was there in 89 and 90, that there was still a lot of resentment amongst the dental patients I saw about the uh, American incursion in 1964. Well, you got two questions. One, yes. are we connected with the Catholic Medical, uh, medical Mission Board? The answer is no. It's a separate institution. It's a Jesuit institution. Uh, they do, we work with them. They provide us with, I don't know the figure, but uh, multi-million dollars worth of medicines every year, which they get from pharmaceutical companies uh, and sometimes buy them. Uh, so we are good partners and we respect them very much. Uh, the resentment you find in the Dominican Republic uh, is the resentment of the small country that was intervened. And uh, those things don't go away. I, as I say, the Serbians, when you speak to Serbians, they tell you about what happened 500 years ago, and that didn't happen to their father. So, uh, yeah, these things stick around. And we think very often that that was a great success in the Dominican Republic. We went in, cleared out a bunch of people who shouldn't have been in government, and cleared up the act and went home. Dominican Republic has had problems ever since, and it still does. You steal people's self-respect, no matter how well-intentioned you are. Uh, and they'll never forgive you for it. And by the way, when I talk about involvement in, in nations and, and, and pushing them toward resolution, I think you've always got to be sensitive to just that, that element as to how far you go before you've passed the, the limit of, of uh, involving yourself too deeply. I do believe sensitivity is a, is, is a virtue of awareness of what's going on in the country. And you can make that judgment in individual cases if you're good enough. If you don't know what you're talking about and you think these countries are all the same because they have the same color skin or they speak the same languages, uh, you're, you're, you're lost at the beginning. Yes? The world has some very strong economies in it. European community with France and Britain and Germany, Japan, and Southeast Asia has the tigers there that are growing. And this business of world leadership is expensive. Uh, why can't we expect them to exert some leadership, and um, how could we encourage them to do so? Well, the question is, uh, you have some world economies that are very strong in Europe, uh, in, the, in the Far East, Japan, the, the tigers of uh, Southeast Asia. And the world leadership is expensive. And why can't we ask them to share some of the cost? Uh, no problem. But leadership is not only a question of, of cost. Um, I don't think it's unfair to say that there isn't a country in the world, certainly since World War II, that has the intrinsic leadership that the United States of America has, not only because of economic power, but because, in, 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 in a strange way, the United States is almost a world country. We, we are an unusual country. I've spent a lot of my time out of this country, and when you're out of it, you, you respect it even more than when you're in it sometimes. We're an unusual people. Um, and we're respected for it. We dislike for it when we act like boobs. But we're respected for what we are, basically. I mean, Lincoln is a world figure. Lincoln is not an American. He's a world figure. Uh, why? Uh, it, it, what I'm talking about is not paying the tab. What I'm talking about is leadership 
which shows the way. The tab, I don't think, is an outlandish tab. When you think of all the money spent on weapons and on defensive issues and all the claptrap we have thrown into security and intelligence and so on, if you start turning that to ways to resolve people's problems and help their economies grow and help them educate themselves and, and live better lives, I think at the end of the day the cost would be less. But once the, once the, the, the inspiration is caught on that indeed you can do something about a Yugoslavia, and, I, and there's no reason going back in history and making people feel bad. The Europeans feel awful about Yugoslavia because they flubbed it and they know it. The French and the British, especially the Germans, know that. And we allowed it because we sat here and said it's a European issue. Well, now it's nobody's issue. Now it's a world issue. And if we're not careful, we're going to have a Balkan war. If the Serbs move in any further south, they go into Macedonia because that's, that's very vulnerable, uh, you may have a very ugly thing occurring very quickly. Uh, and a lot of people are looking at it very carefully now because of the possibility of it spreading into Greece and Turkey and Bulgaria. Now, nobody wants what, what's today, what, what you have today, and the Europeans, I think, are sitting around feeling very sorry for the things they didn't do. So leadership, leadership needn't be to talk about the past but look toward the future and say, look, we have the capacity, if we think it through, and building institutional capability to react to things intelligently. Can you say where we should go next in the Balkans? That's a tough one now. I think, I think you've got to stop the Serbs, uh, and you've got to put constraints on, on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on the Croats. Uh, right now, you're, in, you're very close to the point where the Muslims in that area are thinking of holy war. Uh, and to some extent, they have a, a right or they have a, a, a case because this ethnic cleansing is clearly designed uh, against them. So all you need, and it's happening already, is more arms going, coming in from the Islamic nations into that region to protect the Bosnians and the, and the, the, the other Islamic uh, groups. Uh, and Serbia continuing its aggressive desire for greater Serbia, and you have the makings of a very, very ugly scenario. All could have been avoided early on if Serbia was put on notice, not only by word, but by some early actions that they would not tolerate, the world community or the Europeans would not tolerate some of the things they did. Now, it may have gotten to the point where it would get something nasty, and I don't want to rule out the possibility that some of these would get nasty. But I'd rather see the world community reach a point where it got nasty once in a while for, for a purpose clearly defined, clearly understood, and part of a, a, a discussion among, among the world community. Not easy. I mean, I, I hope this is no cakewalk. I mean, to get from where we are to where we should be is, is, is going to be a very difficult way to go, especially given the fact we're all turning inward. Our economy's turning inward, the Europeans are turning inward, the Japanese are inward. Uh, to, to turn the world community into thinking internationally, not big bucks, but internationally, requires leadership of a high order, which I'm not so sure, you know, is in the offing. <laughs> the Union sent small groups into various countries to train uh, local armed forces. Is it possible now to retrain these people uh, into, uh, into roles which would be more peaceful, peaceful pursuit? Starting with Georgia. Starting with Georgia. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, I mean, we, ha we have in our armed forces, and I'm sure the Soviets do, people with tremendous skills at, uh, on the logistical side, um, on the, the, the delivery of medicine, or at least paramedical kinds of, uh, of, of, of uh, relief, of civic action, putting something in order and keeping it in place. Uh, there are a lot of skills there that are very easily turnable. Now, it doesn't help an F-14 pilot too much, but uh, 
yeah, that's that's the kind of restructuring you need. And I'm convinced that that people would go into the armed forces once you said, here's your new mission. <coughs> here's what we want you to do. Here's the kind of thing you're going to be confronting. You're going to be dealing in very touchy situations. You're going to have to stand tall. You're going to have to behave with discipline. These are the things you're going to have to adhere to. Uh, people love that. You can train that. It's stand up. It's stand up tall. But it has to be a consistent. It has to be part of a policy which is consistent all the way through. And one of the things that's happening to our country, we we run from issue to issue right now. I mean, we're so we're so sort of wallowing around that uh, nobody puts the whole thing together. Maybe the presidential debates will resolve this for us. <laughs> Sorry, yes. What role do you see for an international family planning programs in reducing human suffering? Well, you, you hit on a very sensitive issue for somebody <laughs> from Catholic Relief Services. Um, and uh, I was almost called a lay bishop tonight. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm married with children from a family of seven. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the man who can help you with that. <laughs> yes. Wait a second. Let, I called you. Can I call someone else? No, I just want to say. Okay. Great, great answer. But the, the, the question was, <laughs> how, how, how would you, how would you uh, involve yourself in family planning uh, to resolve some of the problems of the world? And I, my, my friend back there answered very nicely. Yes? Could you describe a little bit about your funding, how you go about allocating your resources, how you go about prioritizing? Well, we, uh, we, do, we do it through a planning process. We, uh, we are decentralized in our planning process because we want to be re very relevant at the field level. So every one of our missions, we have about 46 now, where we staff people in the field. Each year, well, e every third year they write a strategic plan, which says, in effect, this is the kind of country we're in, these are the circumstances, these are the resources coming in, these are the needs, and then they make a case for us doing something, whatever it is. If we agree with that, that becomes the strategic plan. Each year then, they come in with an annual plan which says this year we'd like to do so and so and these are the funds we, we're going to need for administrative overhead uh, program and so on. That then becomes a big, the big issue of debate. In fact, we're right in it right now. We put our budget together toward the end of the year. By December, we will have it resolved. I was just to a meeting today where we, we d dealt with the African countries. Actually, a, an awful lot of it gets pressure cooked inside because uh, the Africa region is going to have to decide how much resource they put into Liberia as compared to Angola. Uh, it's not only how much resource we would like to put in, it's how much resources we can call up. Now, we've got We've got our own resources, which are, which, are, which are limited. Those are the monies that come to us through donors who contribute to Catholic Relief. The big resource flow uh, comes from public sources. We get food from the EEC, and we get food from the U.S. government. So when you're talking about these major programs of food assistance, you have to look at the resource possibilities. So that is balanced off in terms of how much we can expect from EEC or U.S. government in food assistance or medical assistance or whatever else, how much we can, we can get from private sources, and then how much we put in of our own money. And that, you know, the cumulative effect of going country by country ends up being the, uh, the budget round for the year. How big a slice of the pie to give to the London agent? How big a slice to give to the London agent? 
well, you, you, determine, you determine what your capabilities are in delivering, in delivering the, uh, the relief supplies. And uh, we, are not, we, don't, we do not control the universe of, universe of, 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 of supplies. So we, we work in the finite world. Uh, we make, we make a, 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 a appeals to various funders. Right in Somalia now, we're, we're looking at a program that's going to end up being maybe a 20-some-odd million dollar program. Uh, the funds will come from contributions that we get. We're going to be going out with, a, with an appeal for more funds. We're going to be getting food from the World Food Program, which is an institution in, in Rome. We're going to get food from the U.S. government and, and support, supporting assistance, that is the, the money to deliver that food. Uh, we're going to get some support from uh, some uh, agencies in Europe. Uh, the cumulative total of that is going to be 20 million. Could we do 30 million? Uh, possibly. Uh, if tomorrow the situation deteriorates drastically in, in India, where we have a, good, a big program, then we start beefing up on the India side. So it becomes a it becomes as much a reaction as we can handle in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a group of countries. Right now, we're terribly strapped because we're in about seven major crises in Africa. And it's not only the resources, it's the human capability. If we don't have good people on the ground who are willing to live in some of these really sub, subpar areas and suffer through the, the, uh, the physical, the physical uh, duress, uh, if you don't have those people, you can't do a blasted thing. So it becomes not only resources, but human capability, management capability. Good managers are precious, and they're very rare. And we do a lot of training to get people up to speed, and we have to be accountable. I mean, every, every buck we get, every ton of food from the U.S. government, you've got to go through a very serious uh, accountability uh, because you're audited. And, and, and you've, got to, uh, you've got to show where it went. So it, it becomes very complicated in terms of, of designing these programs, managing them, and determining just how much you can do where. Yes? I just don't see the end to this. Uh, we talk about all those premises there, which I highly agree with the problem. But how can we as the United States or any other major country, England, France, Germany, Japan, get into every one of these little disputes. Is that really going to hold it down temporarily? You talked about the Serbs having complaints for 500 years ago. Okay, we put out the fire today. 50 years from now, another 100 years from now, it comes right back up again. How can we possibly decide? What can we do to go in there? I just don't see it. I mean, the concept is wonderful, but are we the policemen of the world? Or is Germany the policemen of the world? Good question. The question is, you know, how are we ever going to deal with these problems? I mean, they're all over the place. They're going to continue. If the Serbs are still arguing about what happened 500 years ago, <laughs> how are we going to resolve the issues? Uh, what maybe you missed in what I, I, I said. We, I said we need leadership from the United States of America to point to the issue, to what the issues are that we're going to be facing. We're going to be facing a series of convulsions and problems around the world, whether we like it or not, whether we do anything or not. Secondly, that we should be looking to the institutions in this country that could be changed and made more capable of resolving some of these or involving themselves. Thirdly, that we should be looking at the UN system to see ways in which that institution can, can handle these things better. And, and fourth, that we should go to sub-regional groupings in the area to see what they can do in the early stages of, of, uh, of resolution of dispute. I think you, 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 can, you can make it sound worse than it is. Actually, resolution of disputes is something that goes on all the time. It's just that the pace of it since the, the, the end of the Cold War has increased. And all I'm saying is that we should be putting in place institutions that could react more intelligently and quicker than they have in the past. Well, on that note of cautious optimism, <laughs> I want to announce that that was the last question. And I want to thank Ambassador Pizzullo for a very enlightening speech. <laughs>